This is Judge Joe Brown, and you're watching We All Be News TV. Me. News Free Dixie for the 21st Century. Good evening, boys and girls, scholars and laymen, and welcome to another wonderful edutainment edition of The Art of Mistakes. I'm your host for the Empowerment Segment, Infotainment Hour, or Empowerment Minute Moment, Brother Run, also known as R2, C2, H2, The Art of this. And we're going to talk about something interesting in the game. We're going to talk about something very interesting today. I am not your coon, or when being two real coons was real black pride. Is it confusing? I don't know. Black folks, we live in contradictions. We are the people behind the mask. We are behind the veil. You know what I'm saying? We are of double consciousness, like the boys talk about, and his souls of black folk. And what I want to talk about is this coon phenomenon from a historical black history perspective. This coon phenomenon Cause like it's like you know in the recent vogue to call other black folks coons, black folks calling other black folks coon, the coon train, all this stuff, and um, a lot of times people don't know why they do what they do because now we live in a social media age, everything spreads, spreads, everything spreads very fast like wildfire. So uh, and a lot of things that I find interesting, even though we live in the information age. A lot of people lack knowledge of self. A lot of people lack knowledge about a lot of things. And a lot of people choose to not be knowledgeable. A lot of people choose not to be responsible because to be knowledgeable, to do research, is to be accountable, is to be responsible. That means you have a duty to inform, inform those who may not be in the know. So I want to talk about a little bit about some history, some black history. It's not necessarily very pretty black history, but in a lot of ways it's very beautiful. It's a beautiful struggle, as we all know. Uh, so, I bring all this to say, I want to talk about a somebody who, went, who was called a nobody. I want to talk about a somebody who was called a nobody. That is the one and only Mr. Nobody, Burt Williams. And you see this uh, artwork behind me. This is something I did back in college. It uh, pays homage to Mr. Burt Williams, Mr. Nobody. Um... It's my home. This is my portrait of him. And uh, he's one of my favorite people to really talk about in black history. Because he was so complex and so contradictory. So who was Burt Williams? First, Burt Williams was like the first, probably the first black superstar in American history. The first acknowledged black comedic genius. It's like he was like what Richard Pryor or Eddie Murphy was in their prime. He set the foundation for the Dick Gregory's and all those people to do uh, social satire, to have the careers they had. He was the first of many, you know. And who was Burt Williams? Well, Burt Williams was born November 12, 1874 in Nassau, Bahamas. He was a Bahamian, but he grew up in America. He grew up in Florida. His family eventually, eventually moved to California. He went to uh, Riverside High School out in California, Riverside, California. He graduated. He wanted to be a civil engineer. I believe he wanted to go to Stanford. It didn't work out, but he also had a talent for acting. So he wanted to do some Shakespeare stuff. That didn't necessarily work out. He ended up becoming, you know, a part of minstrel shows, you know, where they, people dress up in blackface to make fun of black people, making fun of white people, making fun of black people, something like that. It's very confusing, you know. But he ended up going that route instead of becoming a civil engineer. Uh, he went that route in the entertainment business. We could not become a Shakespearean actor. So he ended up meeting his brother from Kansas named George Walker. They became the team Williams and Walker. They built themselves as the two real cones. This is before, this is before NWA. This is before Gangster Rap. This is before all this stuff. This is back in the 1890s 
where these cats going around they Williams and Walker, they're very talented, but they have to you know dress up in blackface to be accepted by white stream America, mainstream America in order to make a living. So they said, well, you know, forget all these white folks dressing up in blackface. Forget all these white folks dressing up in blackface, right? Uh, imitating uh, black folks, imitating white folks, imitating black folks, imitating white folks. Something like that. This is really confusing. Because really, blackface comes from black people mimicking white folks on the plantation. You know, you making fun of master how they do their thing. And also, it was a popular dance. Not the stanky leg. Uh, not, you know, the Harlem Shake, but it was called the cakewalk. We hit, it was a dance. It was basically originated off the plantation. We had the enslaved Africans imitating the 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 you know the manner and style of the white master and his family, how they got down, the dak dee dick dee, whatever, oop doo doo doo. They were making fun of them. And this became a popular dance craze, right? Um, so you have all this in play. So how did this blackface stuff start? You know? Well, you know, you think about, okay, you go back. Uh, remember that the foundation for American entertainment is racism. It is making fun of black people. That's the foundation for American entertainment industry complex. Is the stereotyping and making fun of black people. That is the foundation. Um, you had the first black theater in New York City called the African Grove Theater. That was created by uh, another brother from the islands named William Alexander Brown. He created this theater, the African Grove three, uh, Theater. Uh, he created a play called, I guess, King Shotaway. That was the first play that was created by a African American that premiered in America. So he was a playwright. He was an entrepreneur. He was a theater owner. He had the African Grove Theater. So he had like, you know, a great black actors like James Hewlett and also a young. Ira Aldridge. Ira Aldridge was interesting. Ira Aldridge is one of the greatest Shakespearean actors who ever lived, black or white. Uh, he was one of the greatest Shakespearean actors who ever lived. Uh, he was very famous for his role in Othello. Um, you know, when blackface became in vogue, see, Ira Aldridge was born in New York City. He was born a free black person. So when he saw the blackface coming in vogue in America, he said, The hell of America. Let me go to Europe and become a serious actor. And that's what he what he did. He went to Europe. He was very popular in places like Russia and Poland. And he died in Europe, I believe in England, back in 1867. He had children, and two of his children became world-acclaimed opera singers. He had two daughters who became world-acclaimed opera singers. So it was in the blood. So this is our Audrey. He started as a young man at the African Grove Theater. Uh, he had some success. It catered to a black audience. They had the white folks sitting in the back because the white folks did not know how to behave. Uh, so they had the black folks sitting in the front, you know, which is interesting. But it was very popular, but uh, one of the white theaters did not like the competition. Uh, they used the laws of the land of white supremacy to shut them down. Uh, by 1826, the African Grove Theater was shut down. And uh, some, some sources said it was actually burned to the ground. So uh, y'all should check out the African Grove Theater. Uh, this is back in the 1820s. So then you have T.D. Rice, this uh, white entertainer. He come up with this concept called Jim Crow as his act. And he got this based on looking at, uh, in so many sources that say, now T.D. Rice was a New Yorker, but I believe as traveling on the circuit, on the, on the Vaudeville circuit, or whatever they call it back in the day, he, was, he saw African Americans. He came in close proximity of African Americans in the South. I believe he got the idea for Jim Crow from watching an old black slave uh, say something about Jump Jim Crow, some stuff like that. So basically, you know, whatever idea he had for creating Jim Crow came from black people. And so he became popular by dressing up in blackface as Jim Crow, right? So this is a white entertainer that did that, right? Then you look at the song side, you know, the father of American song is arguably this white dude from, from Pittsburgh named Stephen Foster. Now he wrote, Oh, Susiana, oh, don't you cry for me. If I come from Alabama, I will have a banjo on my knee. Now he only went down south, I guess, one time. And then it was like on a riverboat excursion on the Mississippi River that went all the way to New Orleans. So he's not from the south. He in Pittsburgh, but yet 
he talks about you know black slave life in his songs and a lot of his songs are in the American Songbook it's a foundation for the American Songbook a white dude from Pittsburgh named Stephen Foster so you got the song part and you got the dance and the acting part coming from T.D. Rice and this is a foundation for the American entertainment complex because you got immigrants coming over here who could barely speak English or whatever but they use blackface as a way to get into you know America in order to make a living, to make money, you know, all this stuff. They using they exporting black people like the people who the so called founders of this country use black labor to build this country. You know, so they using black pain in order to build an entertainment complex that cater to white people. So yeah, look up T D Rice, look up Stephen Foster. So get back to Burt Williams. Burt Williams could not be taken seriously as a serious actor because white folks didn't believe that black folks had the intellectual capacity to be taken serious in any area of human activity. You know, like black folks, we see like we seen as being in a infantile mindset or arrested development phase where we were not allowed to be fully functional uh, men and women. We were just, you know, male and female who were who needed uh, white folks to be per paternalistic towards us, to be patronizing and paternalistic towards us. So this is the, the environment that Burt Williams found himself in. So he caters to white folks, lesser angels, him and his partner, so they black enough, even though they black men. Now Burt Williams, he was high yellow, I guess he had freckles, he had red hair, whatever. Kind of like a Terrence Howard type of Negro. You might look like you want no Terrence Howard might look like what Burt Williams look back in the day. Close to Terrence Howard looking type of Negro. Uh, but he, you know, he blackened up all the same and put on some wig and stuff like that and became this character. And even uh, George Walker, he blackened up, even though, you know, you could tell he was a black man. You could tell he was a black man, but they blackened up because there was imitating white folks, imitating black folks who were imitating white people. This is how messed up American racism is. Okay? Everybody wearing a mask, everybody's hiding from somebody. So, and actually, you know, Williams and Walker were, were supremely skilled and good. They, like they said, they advertised themselves as the two real cones. They were the realest cones in the land, and they did their job very well. For example, uh, the first all-black Broadway play was In the Homie. In the Homie opened up on Broadway, I believe, back in 1902, around that time. And it was very successful on Broadway. It was like, you know, all-black cast, and the writers was like people like Will Marion Cook, who was a mentor to Duke Ellington, who, you know, Will Mary Cook was a musical genius and a violinist virtuoso in his own right. And also you had Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Jesse Shipp uh, Sr. He was like three black giants in entertainment who were involved with Williams and Walker on the success of this play. And also, uh, you had the sister named Ida May Overton Walker, who was the wife of, of George Walker. And my God, please do yourselves a favor. Google up this sister. She was probably the first black choreographer in American history. The, the, the first important black choreographer in American history. She was considered the queen of the cakewalk, but she was so gorgeous. She was so beautiful. My God, she was so beautiful. She was beautiful. I mean, not only was she brilliant, but she was really fine. She was fine. You know, and she died so young, unfortunately. She died at the age of 34. Probably from uh, working themselves to death. Because so many of the entertainers, they died young. Because, like, you know, they were working themselves to death. Uh, because a lot of things, you know, a lot of the entertainers back in the day, uh, it was a tough lifestyle. Like, you know, you had the, what they call it, TOBA, that was the booking association uh, of, of these black acts. But a lot of the black entertainers call it tough on black asses. But them, them entertainers worked themselves to death. I mean, they really were professionals. I mean, they they could be held the flu and pneumonia. They still go out on stage and give it all they got. They had a lot of heart, but Adam May, uh, Overton Walker was George Walker's uh, not only wife, but she also she was a business partner with Williams and Walker, and she was a very important component, especially with the choreography. And she did a great job of representing uh, black womanhood on stage. She was a true race race woman. But Google up Adam May Overton Walker, Adam. Uh, Overton Walker and look at her pictures. Man, she was stunning. She was gorgeous. Uh, man, I mean, and she was beautiful.
getting back to in the homie it was the first all black production on broadway you know it was very successful went over to london was the rave it was, it was given a command they gave a command performance before prince edward the eighth at buckingham palace a command performance uh people in london went crazy for in the homie and in the homie was based on africa see what's interesting about them kids back in the day Yes, they use a lot of derogatory slang like coon. They, they describe themselves as coon for their you know, entertainment and for promoting their shows. But they were very conscious about Africa at this time. Because a lot of these plays dealt with Africa, like in the homie. And uh, also Abyssinia, which made reference to Ethiopia, the only country in Africa that was never colonized by the white supremacist powers that be. You know, uh, So they did a lot of their plays about Africa and going back to Africa. So uh, in the homie, yeah. Made Williams and Walkers and their investors a lot of money. Like in today's dollar would be in the millions. Like imagine, like you know, think about Kevin Hart or some of these guys. They they go to these stadiums and sell out and they make all this money. That what Burt Williams then was doing back in 1902, 1904. They were making hundreds of thousand of dollars in 1902, 1904 money, which translates to millions of dollars a day. Like in the homie. Their entire production run made them and their associates like at least three million dollars a piece. Three million dollars a piece was made uh, from in the homie for their business associates and partners who try to sue them for whatever reason. But they won the lawsuit. But anyway, uh, Burt Williams won the first recording stars in uh, music industry. He was one of the first black recording stars. I mean, this is a time where you know, at one point, he became one of the highest paid recording stars in the world. His, 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 his songs would sell like 150,000, 300,000 copies back in the 19 teens and 20s, which was like highly unusual. That's a lot of copies of a, you know, of a, of a song, of a recording he would sell. So he had these lucrative contracts with these recording companies. And we talked about the cakewalk, right? And uh, Adam Mayo Overton Walker was a master of the cakewalk. But also, let's talk about coon songs. See, those songs, we're not talking about two real coons, but I'm talking about the. The, entity, the entertainment industry complex foundation is racism, white supremacy, right? So, you look at my picture, I did a Burt Williams, uh, Mr. Nobody, that's this moniker, Mr. Nobody, and all coons look alike to me. And uh, all coons look alike to me referred to the most popular coon song of all time, which was written by a black man from Bowling Green, Kentucky, named Ernest Hogan. Ernest Hogan wrote a song called All Coons Look Alike to Me. Uh, he is considered the father of ragtime, but people do not give him his credit because of that song. And uh, it's interesting because Scott Joplin is considered the king of ragtime, but Ernest Hogan is considered the father of ragtime. And he wrote that song because he said basically he heard, the, uh, he got the inspiration for the song was when he was in Chicago and you heard somebody playing a song on the piano, at, you know, in the salon that said, all pimps look alike to me. So him saying all pimps look alike to me, he substitute pimp for coon. He said, all coons look alike to me. And the song, the instrumental part of the song is very catchy. It has like a, a cakewalk syncopation to it, which makes it probably the first uh, official ragtime song, right? Because it had a certain distinctive syncopation to it. A certain rhythm to it, all right. So this song and sheep and sheep music sales made him a lot of money. So it wasn't necessarily like the song was very danceable, but what the problem was was the lyrics to the song of all coons looking like to me, as well as the title. And uh, you know, success is a double-edged sword. Ernest Hogan made a lot of money off the sales of the sheep music, but he also lost a lot of his black friends. And he came to regret the fact that he wrote that song. And he died real young. He died at the age of 44 from uh, complications to tuberculosis on May 20th, 1909 in New Jersey. But I just want to read something he said about that song and about his contribution to the art form. To try to, I guess, you know, it bothered him. And like I said, a lot of these entertainers worked themselves to death. Um... Can I even enjoy this success? But it's kind of like it's true today. My, my friend, the late great Emerson Abel told me, he said, Brother Ron, nobody dies a natural death in show business. 
nobody dies a natural death in showbiz. You look at it like, you know, think about the entertainment industry today, especially like the black musicians and black stars. A lot of them die relatively young. Look at Whitney Houston. Look at Prince. Look at Michael Jackson. But Clyde Davis still here. Barry Gordy still here. The folks who don't have the so-called musical talent and star power who works behind the scenes, who promote and cultivate these stars, they live a long life. They live in good, but the folks who who makes make make you know make the songs that are the soundtrack to our lives, like the Princes and Michael Jacksons, the Tupacs, the Whitney's, the Biggies, all these folks die young. Marvin Gaye, they die young and tortured. So it is what it is. This is something y'all should think about. But I just want to say what he said about his contribution and about his thoughts about his own song, All Coons Looking Like to Me. He said, that song caused a lot of trouble in and out of show business. But it was also good for show business because at the time, money was short in all walks of life. With the publication of that song, a new musical rhythm was given to the people. Its popularity grew and it sold like wildfire. That one song opened the way for a lot of color and white songwriters. Finding the rhythm so great, they stuck to it. And now you get hit songs without the word coon. Ragtime was the rhythm played in back rooms and cafes and such places. The ragtime players were the boys who played just by ear their own creations of music, which would have been lost to the world if I had not put it on paper. So that's how he basically uh, so, you know, defended his position on writing that song. And, uh, you know, regardless if we like the fact he wrote the song or the title of the song, he makes a great point. He knew the power of documenting our own creativity, the power of telling our story. You know, it's so important that we as black folks start taking pride and ownership of our story. Stop playing the victim and start being the victor. You know, start you know, being the conqueror in our stories. These are stories. Like he said, he took the time to document this stuff that would have been lost for posterity. You know, he died at 44, but the music lives on. Ragtime lives on. And it would make Scott Joplin the king of ragtime. But he, he too also uh, wrote down the uh, music, musical genius of his co compatriots, of his peers who could not read music. He was some of the most brilliant people of any era. People like Louis Chauvin. Who can remember a whole? Uh, he can remember a whole like you know all the songs in the play, just playing by ear. This dude was able to recall all the songs, every song he ever heard. He could recall and play it in perfect pitch and everything. Ended up dying real young, around the age maybe I think twenty five. But some of his works are still here because of people like Scott Joplin took the time to help notate his genius, to help document his genius. So. Ernest Hogan knew that regardless of what, you know, how he felt about creating this song, uh, All Coons Look Like to Me, he knew that whatever he did, in spite of that, you know, what people may feel about it, it was still important. It, 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 it marked an important turning point in history where, you know, we started documenting our people's uh, stuff. It's like W.C. Handy. He's the king of the blues or whatever you want to call it, the father of the blues, because not because... He was a great blues player, but because he took the time to uh, create the compositions that documented the blues. It's like Ernest Hogan or Scott Joplin took the time to take, you know, the blues and, and, and compose it, to notate it. Same thing with Duke Ellington. You know, members of his band would come up with these brilliant ideas, but they'd just be ideas. And, and, and Duke Ellington would turn them into compositions, to songs that were meant to last for posterity. Things that would just be like, you know, something, something come up in a jam session. He took hold of it and made it into a, a meaningful song. So this is why it's so important that we in 2017, black folks in 2017, take the time to document what we do and do so well. So, getting back to Burt Williams, he sung a lot of coon songs, made a lot of money. You know, because coon songs, before it was rag time and jazz and hip hop, Black music was known as coon songs. So that's something that we just should never forget. And that's why I bring up all this stuff. But uh, yeah, Burt Williams, very popular. Unfortunately, his uh, business partner died. His uh, comedian you know, partner, 
Uh, George Walker died real young. He, we lost him to syphilis. So many of these great uh, black artists at the turn of the century died from complications from syphilis and died real young in their 30s and 40s and 20s because of the conditions. You know what I'm saying? They worked themselves to death a lot of times. And also, you know, just being, you know, at the time. Because, you know, ragtime and this stuff, jazz came out the whorehouses, right? A lot of this stuff came out the underbelly. You know, it was the Prohibition era that really hyped up jazz because you had, you know, the, the, the speakeasies and the underground clubs that were playing jazz. So jazz was part of the counterculture or the subculture of American life. It was not accepted by mainstream. And the term jazz, in some circles, is a derogatory term. Because it has something to do with sex. But also, jazz, like I said, jazz had a connection to the, to the whorehouses. You look at Storyville, New Orleans. Uh, Louis Armstrong. Uh, Louis Armstrong's mama was a, was a, a prostitute. He's dead with a trick. Louis Armstrong grew up in the whorehouses. Louis Armstrong's first wife, Daisy Walker, was a prostitute. So what it makes Louis Armstrong? Like a pimp, like a pimp, like a pimp. Like a pimp. So... We got this romanticized version of life, of black life, around this time period. You know, we need to just really reinvent the wheel and check it out some more about what's really going on back then. And that's why I do stuff like this. But Burt Williams, he paved the way uh, for the black comedic superstar. You know, he was before Richard Pryor, he was before Eddie Murphy, he was before Step and Fetch, he was before, he was before everybody. I mean, like I always said, behind every great white man, is a black mentor that he stole from. A lot of black, I mean, a lot of white comedians borrowed heavily from Burt Williams. His Mr. Nobody was a black tramp. Charlie Chaplin became famous for playing a white tramp. He got that from Burt Williams. People like Eddie Cantor, Will Rogers, Buster Keaton, a lot of these white comedic geniuses, a lot of their stuff were inspired or they stole it from Burt Williams. Like Picasso said, Good artists borrow, great artists steal. Good artists, they borrow while the great artists steal. So a lot of white artists stole a lot from Burt Williams' act. Uh, even Al Jolson, you look at his jazz singer, which was a, a moment in movie history where talkies became popular. Al Jolson was dressed in blackface, talking about, man, 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 man. This white man, he imitated Mr. Burt Williams, Mr. Nobody. I'm nobody, nobody but me. But anyway, yeah, that's all Burt Williams. Burt Williams was the first uh, black star in Zigfield Follies. I don't know, Zigfield Follies was the shit. Zigfield Follies was a Broadway version of Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live. The being of Zigfield Follies was to be like on TV on Saturday Night Live. Uh, Burt Williams was the first black star in there, but they treated him like shit. The white folks in the organization treated him like shit. They would go on strikes and not tell him. So sometimes he would show up to a theater that was empty because all the white actors went on strike and they didn't want to tell Burt Williams. They hated Burt Williams. They hated the fact that he got headliner status. A lot of white actors, they protested that. They formed an organization called the White Rats. And all they was doing was trying to undermine Burt Williams and his career. But the crazy thing about it is the same folks that were protesting and, and said they didn't want to work with Burt Williams as soon as he came on the stage, these white rats, these, these, these bastards would come to the front of the audience to watch his, you know, watch his every move, to listen to his every word. Because Burt Williams was a master comedian. Like the white comedian, the famous W.C. Fields, who was a close friend of Burt Williams, who was inspired by Burt Williams. He said Burt Williams was the funniest man he ever saw but the saddest man he ever knew. Once again, he said Burt Williams was the funniest man he ever saw, but the saddest man he ever knew. Because how he was treated by white supremacy, how these races treated him, like they couldn't accept him as just a human being, as a man of color, as a proud black man. Now, now no, no, Burt Williams was a coon on stage, but was fascinated by these black people at these times. They were, they, they were proud, they were not a shame of being black. I know that a lot of us find it hard to believe that these folks would dress up in blackface and act the fool on stage, but off the stage, they were very concerned about the conditions of their race. They were race men and women. Uh, Burt Williams, you went to his house in, in New York City, you probably found a library that had like 800 to 1,000 books 
on African history, on subjects related to world history as it pertains to the achievements of black people. He had a library like that, 800 to 1,000 books filled on black history and world history. He was an intellectual. He was not a mental midget by any means. He was a comedic genius, but also, I mean, he was sad because you live in a world that could not accept you uh, for being you. He always had to wear that mask. And I also want to read something that Burt Williams talked about uh, as it pertains to black folks and race relations in America. And you can find all this stuff online. Um, there's books on Burt Williams. There's, there's several books you should check out on Burt Williams that came out in the last maybe 30 years. That's worth checking out. But, uh, yeah, I want to talk about what Burt Williams said. He said, people sometimes ask me if I would not give anything to be white. I answer most emphatically, no. How do I know what I might be if I were a white man? I might be a sand hog, burying away and losing my health for $8 a day. I might be a streetcar conductor at $12 or $15 a week. There is many a white man less fortunate and less well equipped than I am. In fact, I have never been able to discover that there was anything disgraceful in being a colored man. But I have often found it inconvenient in America. That's Burt Williams. So Burt Williams was not ashamed to be a black man, but he saw that white supremacy try to make his life difficult when it shouldn't have to be. There's a famous story of Burt Williams going to this uh, very upscale Hotel Astor. The Hotel Astor was located in Manhattan. He went to the bar there. And the bartender was a, a, a racist like it was no racist. He said, well, if you want to drink here, sir, it costs $50. So Burt Williams went into his wallet, started pulling out $100 bill after $100 bill. He said, I'm buying drinks for everybody in the house. That's Burt Williams. Burt Williams was making more money than the president. <coughs> Burt Williams was making basically what would be equivalent to millions of dollars a year back in the 19 teens. This is a time where they were lynching black men and women and children every day, day and a half in this country. And this man was making that type of money. One of the most famous comedians, not only in America, but in the world. One of the most recognizable black men in the world. And yet he had to deal with this bullshit. Think about what I just said. The man went into the bar, bought to the told him it cost $50 for a drink. He pulled out hundreds, several hundred dollar bills and said, I buy for everybody in the house. Wow, amazing. Amazing. So, I mean, you find all this stuff online, people. Uh, probably, some of y'all are probably hearing about this guy for the first time. I'm glad I was able to bring it to you. Uh, Burt William died. He worked himself to death. Uh, March 4th, 1922. He collapsed on stage in Detroit. And people thought it was part of the act and they plotted. And he basically said, oh, well, that's a, that's a way to end your career. You die on stage and people applaud. And so, that was back, I believe, February 26, 1922, uh, in Detroit, March 4th, 1922. He was dead in New York. Uh, he actually had, he was a Freemason. You know, he actually had his funeral at the Masonic Lodge in New York. That was the first time in American history, I believe, that a white Masonic Lodge allowed a black man to lie in state and have a funeral in a Masonic Lodge. So, he was a proud Freemason. And uh, also, Langston Hughes, who was a student at Columbia University, he actually missed his exams at Columbia University just to go uh, to Burt Williams' funeral. That's how much he thought of Burt Williams. And Duke Ellington, one of his songs, he did a portrait of Burt Williams. It's worth listening to. He did sound portraits of some of his dear friends and people he, re he admired from the Harlem Renaissance. And Burt Williams, along with uh, Florence Mills, the song Black Beauty, they are both worth listening to. Florence Mills, another great who died too young. I think she was about 31 when she died. But these black people, they work their asses out to get to a certain point in life. You know, Burt Will was just 47 years old when he died. But he has a living legacy. Like I said, so many white comedic actors from W.C. Fields uh, to Buster Keaton to Charlie Chaplin to Eddie Cantor to Will Rogers, they owe a debt to the genius of Burt Williams. He laid the foundation down for what was to come in terms of black entertainers from the Richard Pryors, the Jamie Foxes, the Kevin Hart's, uh, the Dave Chappelle's, I mean, Dick Gregory's, 
You can name them all. He's the father of, of them all. He's the father of them all. Bert Williams, Louis Armstrong, the father of them all. You know. So, uh, what else I wanted to add? Well, yeah, I want this quote that Booker T. Washington said about Bert Williams. I thought it was fascinating. Worth mentioning. Find it. Yeah, in 1910, Booker T. Washington wrote a Williams. He has done more for our race than I have. He has smiled his way into people's hearts. I have been obliged to fight my way. Yep. So, yeah. Bill Williams, you have not been forgotten. We thank you for your service. In the words of Duke Ellington, we love you madly. So, boys and girls, scholars and laymen, you like what you heard? Please spread the word for Mr. Heard. Word up. Subscribe to the channel. Keep it amplified and movement. We're trying to create a lot of interesting things for you all in 2017. The best is yet to come. Feel free to donate to the cause. This is the one man we all be army for all of us. For all of us. For all of ours. Uh, the time has come. The ancestors won't pay back with the interest. Okay? So thank you all for listening once again. In the words of Great Together, once again, we love you madly. Keep on producing and pushing.